In this video, we're going to focus on finding intervals when a function is increasing, when it's decreasing, when it's concave up, concave down, any inflection points, and critical points as well, in addition to any relative extrema, any local maximums and minimum values. So you need to know that whenever a function is increasing in value, the first derivative is positive. So that means the slope is positive. And if a function is decreasing in value, the first derivative is negative. If f is constant, then the first derivative is equal to 0. The tangent line to the curve at that point is horizontal. Now there's two ways a function can increase in value. It can increase at a decreasing rate, or it can increase at an increasing rate. In both cases, the first derivative is positive. Now, there's two ways a function can decrease in value. It can decrease at an increasing rate, or it can decrease at a decreasing rate. In both cases, the function is decreasing, so the first derivative is negative. And whenever you have a horizontal line, the function is constant, so the first derivative is equal to 0. So let's say if we have a graph, and it looks something like this. So in this region, the function is increasing. The first derivative is positive. In the second region, it's decreasing. So the first derivative is negative. And in the third region, it's increasing again. So the first derivative is positive. Now at this point, at the local maximum, which is this point right here, the first derivative is 0 because the tangent line is horizontal. The slope is 0. And at the local minimum value, the first derivative is also 0. So whenever the first derivative changes from a positive value to a negative value, you have a local maximum. And whenever it changes from, let's say, a negative value to a positive value, you have a local minimum or a relative minimum. And you can use that in the first derivative test whenever you want to find out if you have a local max or local min. So here we have a local max, or a relative maximum. Now notice that the first derivative to the left is positive. It's increasing, and then it decreases. So anytime the first derivative changes from a positive to a negative, you have a local max. Now, if it changes from negative to positive, that means the function is decreasing, then it's increasing. And so what you have here is a local minimum. Now, what about critical numbers? A critical number or a critical point occurs when the first derivative is either equal to 0 or if the first derivative does not exist. So at a local max, you have a critical point. At this point, the first derivative is 0 at any local maximum. At a local minimum, the first derivative is 0. So those are critical points. But also, let's say if you have a cusp. Here we have a local max. The function is continuous, but it's not differentiable at this point. The derivative doesn't exist, but it's still considered a critical point. So those are some examples of critical points. Now, when is the function concave up? And when is it concave down? A function is concave up when the first derivative, or rather, the second derivative, is positive. The function is concave down 
when the second derivative is negative. When it's concave up, the first derivative is increasing in value. And when it's concave down, the first derivative or the slope is decreasing in value. So when a graph is like this, it's concave up. It's an upward parabola, or a parabola that opens in the upward direction. If it opens downward, this is a concave down shape. So there's four shapes in calculus that you need to be familiar with. These are the four shapes. So on the upper left, the function is increasing. So the first derivative is positive. It's increasing at a decreasing rate. And in the bottom right, the function is increasing at an increasing rate. In both cases, it's increasing. So the first derivative is positive. Here, the function is decreasing, so the first derivative is negative, and for this one, too, it's a decreasing. Now, for these two, notice that it forms a concave down shape. So that means that the second derivative is negative. And for this one, too. Now, if you look at the two on the bottom, it's concave up. So that means that the first derivative, or the second derivative, is positive. So now let's think about it. Why is this shape concave down? We know that the second derivative is negative. And we said that when the second derivative is negative, that means that the first derivative is decreasing in value, which means the slope is decreasing. At this point, on the left side, would you say the slope is positive, negative, or zero? Since the function is increasing, the slope is positive. But let's put a number to it. So let's say the slope is about 1. At the top, the slope is 0. And at this point over here, the slope is roughly negative 1. So as you travel from left to right, the slope is decreasing in value. It went from 1 to 0 to negative 1. So because the first derivative is decreasing in value, the second derivative is negative. So therefore, it's concave down. The slope is decreasing. Now let's look at the other situation. We said that this is concave up, so the second derivative is positive which means that if the second derivative is positive, that's the slope of the first derivative. Therefore, the first derivative must be increasing. The slope on the left side is negative because the function is decreasing. At the bottom, the slope is 0. And over here, it's positive, so we'll say positive 1. From left to right, the slope is increasing from negative 1 to 0 to 1. So therefore, this is concave up. The second derivative is positive. Now what about inflection points? Inflection points occur when the concavity changes, either from positive to negative or negative to positive. So anytime the second derivative is equal to zero, and if, if the concavity changes, then you have an inflection point. If the concavity does not change, even if the second derivative is zero, then it's not an inflection point. So a good example of an inflection point is right here. At that point, the second derivative is equal to 0. In this region, it's concave up. You can see the upward problem. So the second derivative is positive. And in this region, it's concave down. So the second derivative is negative. So in order for it to change from positive to negative, it must cross 0. And between those two points, right in the middle, that's when you have the inflection point right here. That's where the concavity changes from concave up to being concave down. Now let's analyze the slopes of this graph. So on the left, the slope is about negative 1. And at the bottom, the slope is 0. And roughly around this point, the slope is positive 1 since it's increasing. 
But over here, it's still about positive 1. And then it's back to 0. And then negative 1. So as you can see, in this region, the slope is increasing. It went from negative 1 to 0 to 1. Therefore, the second derivative is positive. But notice that in this region, the slope remained constant. It stayed at 1. So the slope is not increasing. If the slope is not increasing, if it's constant, that means the derivative of the slope function, which is the second derivative, that's equal to 0. So this is the inflection point, where the slope is constant. And then after that, the slope decreases from 1 to 0 to negative 1. So when the slope decreases, or when f prime decreases, f double prime is negative. So you can see where the, the inflection point occurs. It's when the slope stops increasing. When the slope remains constant, that's when you have the inflection point, and if the concavity changes. Now let's work on an example. Let's say if we have the function x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5. So go ahead and determine when the function is increasing, when it's decreasing, when it's concave up, when it's concave down, any critical numbers, local extreme values, inflection points, everything. So the first thing you want to do is you want to find the first derivative of the function. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, and the derivative of 3x squared is 6x. The derivative of a constant like 5 is 0. Now once you have the first derivative function, set it equal to 0 and solve for x. So let's remove the GCF, the greatest common factor, which is 3x. 3x squared divided by 3x is simply x, and negative 6x divided by 3x is negative 2. So now let's solve for x. So if we set 3x equal to 0 and x minus 2 equal to 0, we're going to get two values, or two critical numbers. And those two critical numbers are x is equal to 0 and x is equal to plus 2, if we add 2 to both sides. Here, if you divide by 3, 0 divided by 3 is 0. So now that we have the two critical numbers, 0 and 2, let's put them in a number line. So we have 0 and 2. Now we need to create a sign chart. So let's plug in a number that's greater than 2 into the first derivative function, particularly the one that's in the factored form. So let's try 3. 3 minus 2 is a positive number, and 3 times 3 is positive. So overall, any number greater than 2 will make the first derivative function positive. Now let's plug in a number between 0 and 2. So let's try 1. 1 minus 2 is a negative number, and 3 times 1 is positive. A negative times a positive number will give you a negative result. So now let's plug in a number less than 0. Let's try negative 1. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, so that's a negative. And 3 times negative 1 is a negative number. Two negative numbers multiplied to each other will give you a positive number. So this is the first derivative sign chart. So at 0, do we have a local max or a local minimum value? What would you say? Notice that the function, or the first derivative, changes from positive to negative. So that means that the function is increasing, and then it's decreasing. So therefore, at 0, we have a local maximum value. Now what about at 2? Notice that the function is decreasing because the slope is negative, and then it's positive. So it's decreasing, and then it's increasing. So therefore, 2 is a local minimum value. The critical numbers, as you mentioned, are 0 and 2. Now what are the intervals where the function is increasing and when it's decreasing? It's increasing when it's positive, and it's decreasing when the first derivative is negative. All the way to the left, we have negative infinity, and on the right, positive infinity. So now let's write the intervals of increase and decrease. So the uh, function is increasing 
on the interval from negative infinity to zero, and then union two to infinity. So it's increasing in this region and in this region. Now the function is decreasing when the first derivative is negative, and that is between zero and two, which is in this region. So that's how you can write the intervals whether the function is increasing or decreasing. Now, how can we find when the function is concave up and when it's concave down? So to do that, we need to find the second derivative. Let's find the first derivative one more time. We know it's 3x squared minus 6x. So to find the second derivative, it's going to be the derivative of 3x squared is 6x, and the derivative of 6x is simply 6. Now let's set it equal to 0. And let's take out the GCF, which is 6. So therefore, the potential critical, or the potential inflection point, is 1. At x equals 1, the second derivative is equal to 0. Now let's plug in a number greater than 1 and less than 1. Let's say if we plug in 2. 2 minus 1 is positive, times 6, that's a positive result. And if we plug in a number less than 1, let's say 0, 0 minus 1 is negative, times 6 is still negative. So the function is concave down when the second derivative is negative. So it's concave down on the interval negative infinity to 1. And the function is concave up in this region, or on the interval 1 to infinity. You can just write it from left to right. Now, because the concavity changes sign, because it changes from concave down to being concave up, 1 is an inflection point. Now, let's analyze the curve graphically. So the graph looks something like this. This is just a, a rough sketch. So as you can see, from negative infinity to an x value of 0, the function is increasing. That means that the first derivative is positive at that point. And then from 0 to 2, the function is decreasing. So the first derivative is negative in that region. And from 2 to infinity, the function is again increasing. So when it's increasing, the first derivative should be positive. Now at 0, we have a local maximum value since the first derivative changes from positive to negative. And at 2, we have a local minimum value, since the first derivative changes from negative to positive, according to the first derivative test. Now what about the concavity? Notice that at 1, 1 is the inflection point. That's when the concavity changes. So between 0 and 1, notice that it's concave down. You can see the concave down shape. Now from 1 to infinity, notice the concave up shape. You can see it here. The graph is concave up. So we could see everything from the graph at this point. Let's try another example. Let's say that f of x is equal to x squared minus 1 squared. Go ahead and find everything 
when a function is increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down, critical points, local extreme values, and inflection points. So just like before, we're going to find the first derivative. So in this particular problem, we need to use the chain rule. So first, let's start with the power rule. Let's move the 2 to the front. So it's going to be 2 times. Now we need to keep everything in the inside of the parentheses exactly the same way it was before. So it's 2 times x squared minus 1, and then subtract this number by 1. So it's raised to the first power. Now we need to take the derivative of the inside part of the function. The derivative of x squared minus 1 is 2x. So whenever you have a composite function, let's say f of g of x, to find the derivative, you want to differentiate the outside part of the function, in that case using the power rule. And then you want to keep the inside part the same, and then multiply it by the derivative of the inside part of the function, which is basically what we did here. So now that we have the first derivative, let's set it equal to 0. And let's make sure it's completely factored. 2 times 2x, we can combine it and make it 4x. x squared minus 1, we can factor it. It's going to be x plus 1 times x minus 1 if we use the difference of perfect squares method. So the critical numbers are positive 1, negative 1, and 0. If you set 4x equal to 0, then x will be 0. Now let's place the critical points on the number line in the appropriate order. So now let's see what the sign of the first derivative will be if we plug in a number greater than 1. Let's try 2. 2 minus 1 is positive. 2 plus 1 is a positive number. And 4 times 2 is positive. So three positive numbers multiplied to each other will give you a positive result. So the first derivative is positive when x is greater than 1. Now since the multiplicity of each 0 is an odd number, it's 1, the sign is going to change. So let's say if we plug in a number between 0 and 1, let's say 0 0.5. 0 0.5 minus 1 is negative, 0 0.5 plus 1 is positive, and 4 times 0 0.5 is positive. So two positive numbers times a negative number will give you a negative result. Now let's say if we plug in negative 0.5. Negative 0.5 minus 1 is negative. Negative 0.5 plus 1, that's positive 0.5. And 4 times negative 0.5 is negative 2. So we have one positive number, two negative numbers, that will give you a positive result. If we plug in, let's say, negative 2. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative. 4 times negative 2 is a negative number. Three negative numbers multiplied to each other will give you a negative result. So anytime the exponent is odd, the sign is going to change. If it's even, it's going to stay the same across that number. So at negative 1, do we have a local max or a local min? Notice that the function decreases, then increases. So negative 1 is a local minimum value. At 0, it increases, then decreases. So 0 is a local max. And at 1, it decreases, then increases. So 1 is a relative minimum value. Now, when is the function increasing, and when is it decreasing? The function is increasing when the first derivative is positive. So we could say it's increasing on the interval negative 1 to 0, union 1 to infinity. So that's in this region here. Now what about when the function is decreasing? The function is decreasing in this region and in this region when the first derivative is negative. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1, union 0 to 1. Now, in order to find when the function is concave up and concave down, we need to find a second derivative. Let's rewrite the first derivative as 4x 
times x squared minus 1. And now we can find the second derivative. So we need to use the product rule. So if you have two functions, f times g, and you wish to find the derivative using the product rule, it's going to be f prime g plus f g prime. So let's say f is 4x and g is x squared minus 1. If f is 4x, then f prime is the derivative of 4x, which is simply 4, times g, and then plus f, which is 4x, times g prime, the derivative of x squared minus 1, that's going to be 2x. So now let's simplify the result that we currently have. So if we distribute the 4 to x squared and negative 1, it's going to be 4x squared minus 4. And 4x times 2x is positive 8x squared. So the second derivative is equal to twelve x squared minus four. So let's clear away a few things. So let's set it equal to zero and let's solve for x. So we can take out a four and we'll be left with three x squared minus one. Now let's factor this expression. Using a difference of perfect squares is going to be root 3x minus 1 times root 3x plus 1. The square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 3 is root 3, and the square root of x squared is just x. So you get root 3x and 1. And because this is the uh, difference of perfect squares, so one is going to be negative and the other is going to be positive. So for example, if you want to find the square root or if you want to factor x squared minus 25, it's going to be the square root of x squared, which is simply x, the square root of 25, which is 5. One is positive, and the other is negative. So that's the technique I use to factor this expression. So now that we have it, we can find when it's concave up and concave down. So the second derivative is 0 when root 3x minus 1 is equal to 0. So if you solve for x, it's going to be positive 1 over root 3. And for the other one, it's uh, negative 1 over root 3. For those of you who want to see how I got that answer, set each factor equal to 0. So here, let's add 1 to both sides. And then divide by root 3. So x is 1 over root 3. Now you can rationalize 1 over root 3. If you multiply the top and bottom by root 3, you're going to get root 3 over 3, which is about 0.577 as a decimal. Now let's say if we plug in 1. Root 3 times 1 plus 1, that's positive. 1 times root 3 minus 1 is positive. Root 3 by itself is about 1.73. Minus 1, that's going to be a positive result. So it's positive over here. Because the multiplicity is odd, the sign will change. So therefore, negative root 3 over 3 and root 3 over 3 are inflection points since the concavity changes. Now, when is the function concave up and when is it concave down? So it's concave up when the second derivative is positive. So it's concave up in the interval starting from negative infinity to negative root 3 over 3, and then union positive root 3 over 3 to infinity. So that's when it's concave up. Now when is it concave down? The function is concave down in this region. So that's between negative root 3 over 3 and positive root 3 over 3. So that is it for this particular problem. Now, let's try some harder examples. Let's say that f of x is equal to x times the square root of x plus 4. So go ahead and find everything. When the function is increasing, decreasing, 
the critical points, inflection points, when it's concave up, concave down, and then the local extreme values. So we need to use the product rule again. By the way, radical x plus 4 can be rewritten as x plus 4 raised to the 1 half. Now, according to the product rule, we're going to differentiate the first part of the function, that's x. So let's say if x is f and g is x plus 4 to the 1 half, f prime is going to be 1 times g, which is, I'm going to leave it as square root x plus 4 for now, and then plus f, which is x, times g prime, which is 1 half, keep the inside the same, x plus 4, and then subtract the exponent by 1. 1 half minus 1 is the same as 1 over 2 minus 2 over 2, which is negative 1 over 2. And then if you take the derivative of the inside of x plus 4, that's just times 1, which won't change anything. So what we have is the square root of x plus 4 plus x divided by 2 root x plus 4. So since we have a negative exponent, we want to move the x plus 4 to the bottom. And it's going to be positive 1 half, which is the same as root x plus 4. Now what you want to do is you want to combine these two terms into a single fraction. So we need to multiply the first term by 2 root x plus 4, top and bottom. Whatever you do to the top, you must always do to the bottom. So the square root of x plus 4 times the square root of x plus 4 is simply x plus 4. So now that we have the same denominator, we can combine these two expressions into a single fraction. So 2 times x plus 4 is going to be 2x plus 8. And if you add x to it, it's going to be 3x plus 8 divided by 2 radical x plus 4. So that's the first derivative in its simplified form. Now that we have the first derivative, what can we do to find the critical numbers? The critical numbers occur when the first derivative is equal to 0, or if the first derivative does not exist. Now if you have a fraction, whenever the numerator of the fraction is equal to 0, the whole thing is 0. If the denominator is equal to 0, then it's undefined or you could say it doesn't exist. So you want to set the numerator equal to 0 and the denominator equal to 0 separately. If we set the numerator equal to 0, then the critical number will be at negative 8 over 3. If we set the denominator equal to 0, then we're going to get this value. If we divide by 2, 0 divided by 2 is simply 0. If we square both sides to get rid of the radical, 0 squared is 0. So x is negative 4. That's the other critical number. Now keep in mind, the function is continuous at negative 4, like, meaning you can plug in negative 4 into the function, but it's not differentiable at negative 4 because you get a 0 in the denominator. Now because we have a square root function, the domain is restricted. To find out the domain of square root x plus 4, set the inside equal to or greater than 0. So x has to be equal to or greater than negative 4. So x can't be negative 5. Negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1, and you can't have a negative number inside a square root with an even index number. So this function is restricted on the domain negative 4 to infinity. So the function includes negative 4 but it's not differentiable at negative 4. Nevertheless, we're still going to use negative 4 as a critical number. So we have two critical numbers. Negative 8 over 3 is about negative 2.67. So let's say if we plug in 1 into the equation. 
3x plus 8, or 3 times 1 plus 8, that's going to be positive. And the square root of 1 plus 4 is positive. So everything is going to be positive to the right of negative 8 over 3. If you plug in 0, this will be 8, that's going to be square root 4, they're still positive. Now, if we plug in a number between negative 4 and negative 8 over 3, let's say negative 3, it's going to be negative. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9, plus 8, that's negative 1. Negative 3 plus 4 is positive 1, square root of 1 is positive 1. So it's positive on the bottom, negative on top, so it's negative overall. Now, we can't plug in a number less than negative 4 because the domain is from negative 4 to infinity. So we have a restricted domain for this problem. So at negative 8 over 3, notice that we have a local minimum value. The function is decreasing and increasing. Now the function is increasing in this interval. So it's increasing from negative 8 over 3 to infinity. And the function is decreasing from negative 4 to negative 8 over 3, where the first derivative is negative. So now let's find the second derivative. In order to do that, we need to use the quotient rule. So let's say this is f and this is g. So the quotient rule, it's going to be g f prime minus f g prime over g squared. So g, that's going to be 2 radical x plus 4 times f prime. The derivative of 3x plus 8 is simply 3 minus f g prime. So f is 3x plus 8. And then g prime, that's going to be 2. And square root x plus 4 is basically x plus 4 to the 1 half. So let's move the 1 half to the front. Let's keep the inside the same. And then it's going to be raised to the minus 1 half. And the derivative of the inside function of x plus 4, that's going to be 1. So it's not going to change anything. Divided by g squared, or 2 times radical x plus 4 squared. So now let's simplify what we have. Let's get rid of this stuff. And let's move this up. So 2 and 1 half will cancel. So what we have is 6 times the square root of x plus 4 minus 3x plus 8. Now this, we can move it to the bottom as a radical. So it's going to be under 3x plus 8. And on the bottom, 2 squared is 4. And radical x plus 4 squared is simply just x plus 4. So what we can do at this point is multiply the top and the bottom by radical x plus 4. So radical x plus 4 times 6 radical x plus 4. The radicals cancel, and it's just going to be 6 times x plus 4. Now, if we multiply these two, these will cancel, and it's simply going to be negative 3x plus 8. And on the bottom, it's going to be 4 times x plus 4 times radical x plus 4. So now let's simplify what we have in the numerator. So it's 6x plus 24 minus 3x minus 8 divided by everything on the bottom. 6x minus 3x is 3x, and 24 minus 8 is 16. So this is what we now have. So this is equal to the second derivative. Now, if we set the numerator equal to 0, we can see that a potential inflection point will be at negative 16 over 3.
which is about negative 5.33. And if we set the denominator equal to 0, it's going to be 0 when x plus 4 is 0, and that's negative 4. So the two points of interest are negative 4 and negative 16 over 3. Now keep in mind, the domain of the whole function is restricted from negative 4 to infinity, so we can't plug in anything to the left side. So let's plug in a number greater than, actually, we can't even use this number. I've placed this in the wrong location. Negative 16 over 3 is greater than negative 4. So it should be like this. So that means that this number is not even in the domain of the function. So we can't even use that. Now, let's say if we plug in a number greater than negative 4. Let's say 0. 3 times 0 plus 16, that's positive. And 0 plus 4 is positive, and that's positive as well. So the second derivative will be positive when x is greater than negative 4. It's undefined when it's equal to negative 4. So it's concave up from negative 4 to infinity. And the function, according to what we have here, it's never concave down. So that means that the slope is always increasing. Now, because the concavity does not change sign, there's no inflection points for this particular problem. So this is going to be the last example for today. So let's say that f of x is equal to x raised to the 4 thirds plus 4x to the 1 third. So let's find the first derivative. So it's going to be 4 thirds x raised to the 4 over 3 minus 1 is the same as 4 over 3 minus 3 over 3, which is going to be positive 1 third. And then this is going to be 4 times 1 third and then x, 1 third minus 1 is 1 third over th minus 3 over 3, which is negative 2 over 3. So now what we need to do at this point is we need to take out the GCF, which is 4 thirds, and it's the smaller of these two values. Negative 2 over 3 is smaller in value than 1 over 3, so we want to factor out x to the negative 2 thirds. So x to the 1 third divided by x to the negative 2 thirds will give you what's inside. If you divide these two, you need to subtract the exponents. 1 third minus negative 2 thirds is positive 3 over 3, which is simply 1. So you get x to the first power. So we can simply write x. Now we took out the 4 thirds and we took out this. so the only thing that's left over is plus 1. Now we need to rewrite it. The 4 is on top, and this will remain on top since it has a positive exponent. The 3 is on the bottom, and this x variable has a negative exponent, so we need to move it to the bottom. So it's going to be 4 x plus 1 divided by 3 x raised to the 2 thirds. Now once you have the first derivative in this form as a fraction, then you can set it equal to zero and find the critical numbers. So if we set the numerator equal to zero, the critical number is x is equal to negative one. If we set the bottom part equal to zero, then the critical number is x is equal to zero. Now, if we consider the original function, x is, x can be anything, so the function is continuous everywhere, so we don't have any restrictions. However, it's not differentiable at 0, because it's going to be undefined if we plug in 0 into the first derivative. So in a situation like this, what we have is a cusp at some point, and typically the cusp is going to be at 0, since 
the cusp is not differentiable at the vertex. Now let's say if we plug in a number greater than zero. Let's try one. One plus one is positive, and one raised to the two thirds power is one, so that's positive. So it's going to be positive when x is greater than zero. Now let's check the sign of the first derivative when x is between negative one and zero. So let's try negative point five. Negative point five plus one is positive. Negative point five raised to the two thirds. Because of the even numerator, it's going to be a positive number. Because you have to take the cube root, which it will stay negative at that point, and then you have to square it, which will make it positive. So two positive numbers will give you a positive result for the first derivative. So as you can see, we have an even uh, exponent. You could ignore the 3. So notice that it doesn't change sign around 0. Now for negative 1, it's going to change sign because the exponent is odd. So if we plug in negative 2, negative 2 plus 1 is negative. Negative 2 to the 2 thirds is going to stay positive because we're squaring it. And then we're taking the cube root of it. So the whole thing is negative to the left of negative 1. Now, at negative 1, do we have a minimum value or a maximum value? So negative 1, it decreases then increases. So in this case, it's a, a minimum value. Now what about at 0? What's going on at 0? So the function is increasing and then it increases again. It could be like this, or maybe it could be like this. It's increasing and then increasing again. We know it's not differentiable at zero. So chances are it's probably not like this because this is a smooth change. Even though the slope is positive and then it's positive, it's temporarily zero. But we have a vertical asymptote at zero for the first derivative. So chances are it's probably not like that. It could be like this. Increasing and then maybe like that. Here we could have a vertical tangent which will make it not differentiable at zero. Either case it's increased in both cases, so we don't have a max or min at zero. Now, if you were to graph this function, let's say using a graphing calculator, it looks something like this. So you can see at negative one, we do have a minimum. But at zero, notice that we do have a vertical tangent. The function is increasing and then it continues to increase. So it does appear to look something like that. Now what about when the function is increasing and when it's decreasing? So the interval when the function is increasing is from negative 1 to 0 and well, it's still increasing at zero, so we can just say negative one to infinity. The function is continuous at zero, even though it's not differentiable at zero due to the vertical tangent, but it's still continuous, and it's still going up at zero, so we can just say zero is included. Now, the function is decreasing from negative infinity to negative one. Now, that's it for the first derivative. Now let's find a second derivative using the quotient rule. So we know the form is going to be g f prime minus f g prime divided by g squared, where f is the top part of the function and g is the bottom part. 
So the top part, you can view it as 4x plus 4, if you distribute the 4. So g is going to be 3x to the 2 thirds times f prime. The derivative of 4x is 4, and the derivative of 4 is 0. Minus f, which is 4 times x plus 1, times g prime, which is 3 times 2 thirds times x raised to the negative 1 third, that's 2 thirds minus 1, divided by g squared, which is 3x to the 2 thirds squared. So what we now have is 12x to the 2 thirds, and 4 and 3 is still 12. Well, we can cancel a 3. So this is going to be 4 times 2, and that's 8. So it's going to be minus 8 times x plus 1. And this, we can move it to the bottom, divided by x to the positive 1 third. And on the bottom, we have 3 squared, which is 9. And x raised to 2 thirds squared is x to the 4 thirds. 2 thirds times 2 is 4 thirds. So now we need to get rid of this term. So let's multiply top and bottom by x to the 1 third. So x to the 1 third times 12 x to the 2 thirds. 1 third plus 2 thirds is 3 over 3, which is 1. So we get 12 x to the first power. And then these two cancel, so it's negative 8x minus 8. And then 4 thirds plus 1 third is 5 third. So 12x minus 8x, that's 4x, so it's 4x minus 8. And then we could take out a 4. So it's 4 times x minus 2 divided by 9x to the 5 over 3 power. So this is the second derivative. So if we set the numerator equal to 0, we can get a critical number of 2. And if we set the bottom equal to 0, 0 to the 5 thirds is 0. So the next point of interest is 0. Now, if we plug in 3, 3 minus 2 is positive, and 3 to the 5 over, or 3 raised to the 5 thirds power, that's positive 2. Now, if we plug in 1, 1 minus 2 is negative, 1 raised to the 5 over 3 is positive, so overall it's negative. So notice that we have an odd exponent. So therefore, it's going to change sign across every number of interests. So if we plug in negative 1, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, but negative 1 to the 5 thirds is negative 1 because this is odd. So two negatives divided by each other will give us a positive result. So we can say that the function is concave up in these two intervals. So it's concave up from negative infinity to 0, union 2 to infinity. And it's concave down from 0 to 2. So therefore, 0 is an inflection point, since the concavity changes at 0. And 2 is an inflection point, because the concavity changes at 2 as well. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching and have a great day.